I've left all my CDs at home. So I want you to help me with the music cues, okay? It'll work like this. It's like a, a Salvation Army parlor game. As soon as I start singing, join in when you know what I'm singing. Okay? <clears throat> Good afternoon, musicians, dancers, singers, painters, tech supporters, composers, arrangers, songwriters, artists of all stripes, welcome to the world of creative worship arts. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 Clever. <laughs> I want you to imagine yourself in the Holy of Holies, or as close as we can get, perhaps a nice Gothic cathedral where there's stained glass and a sense of traditions past a place where the best has been offered to our Lord, a place where the acoustics and the somehow the ambiance of the place transports the worshiper to a sense of nearness to God. Are you there? The text for today's sermon is taken from the great big book of me. If I were doing a sermon on Sunday morning, I cannot let the people know that it's about me. I've had to think it. I've had to study it. I've had to pray it. But it can't be about me. It has to be about something greater than me. And this is where all of the creative arts come together, whether you're a painter or a dancer or a musician or a singer or someone that controls the level of the sound of my voice or pushes the button on the PowerPoint slide. It cannot be about you. It has to be about God. If our message is not anchored in the Word of God, what is it we're doing? This um, talk this afternoon, this keynote session, is about my favorite subject. My favorite subject is Words are important. Words are important. In fact, the word is what propels all of our mission, and all of our visioning, all of our music making. Anything creative we do is anchored in the word of God. As we wrote it down all those centuries ago, and as he imparts his word, capital W, through his spirit, our first task in inventing anything for the worship context is to come into contact with the word that is Im, um, embedded in the tunes that we sing, the words of the song. Uh, and that's all I have to say on the subject. But since I have Since I have 19 minutes left, just like on Sunday, I'll say it again. And again and again in different ways. And I'll take you on a little journey with me as a creative person through some of my tasks and show you what I mean by the word is important. Let's share a prayer together. Father, we look to your spirit to enliven us and make us awake to your word present. In scripture and alive through your spirit. Let it quicken us in our activities, whatever they are, creatively for you. Amen. Middle school, grades uh, 6, 7, and 8. I don't know if it's similar here, but um, about the age of uh, 10, I suppose, 11, we had a set of books that we did, and they were called Words Are Important. Now, this is a long time ago, so I'm sure uh, they've changed things a long time ago, but 
the word for the day was dubious. And the teacher looked around the room at all us little kids and said, does anybody know what dubious means? I, my hand shot up, and I was the only one in the class that knew what dubious meant. And, and if you don't know, it means doubtful. <laughs> it means doubtful. Uh, my sister brought me to words. She was a, and still is a scholar and a poet and a, someone invested in the English language. And as a child, my father read to me Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island. And I read the classics myself. I read Christmas Carol, Mark Twain, just about all of the Dickens books. And I, by degrees, I came to really love the way words go together and how, how much fun you can have with words and how they lay on the tongue a certain way. And some words sound like what they mean, like sizzle and muffin. <laughs> What a wonderful language you have. And, and so when I came to being uh, involved in creating music and creating poetry and, and writing songs, I loved the way I could play with internal rhymes and come up with rhythms that would help um, the, the text of a song kind of live. So, it, you know, in 1960-something, uh, when I was starting to put notes on a page, the choral tradition in the army at that time was pretty strophic, same music, verse after verse, no piano part, just kind of... Now, there were some great songs around, like In the Secret of Thy Presence, and there was some wonderful music, but so much of it was strophic, same every verse, and just crotchets, a minimum now and again. Maybe a crescendo, maybe a verse that you did quietly. So there wasn't a lot of attention paid to the rhythm of words. And without thinking about it, without feeling like I had something different to give to the discipline, I just, when it was my turn to start writing, I began to play more with the way rhythms and words go together. And that's the first thing I, I want to bring to your attention, is that we have a wonderful language and we have to find a way of paying attention to it as we inculcate words into our expressions, whether they are musical or dance or movement or painting or the sung word. Um, I would strengthen, um, strengthen that idea by saying I, I don't think there's anything more important to me as a creative arts person in my job uh, than words. There's nothing more important. Sing with me. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken. At the end of broken dreams. He's the open. He's the open door. People. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize? When will we realize? People need the Lord. Thanks for following. That's an old song, and we've sung it so many times it doesn't grab us anymore, but how easily we get to the heart of the matter. And when I think about the heart of that message, I melt with its simplicity. And I realize as a singer, I need to lean into the word need. People need... I have to sing the end on. People need the Lord. If you're writing down that melody, it would be two eighth notes and then a quarter note, two short notes. People need the Lord. So the writer, uh, Steve Green, has, has known how important that text is. He travels to the important note and then away from it. When will we realize... He brings us up to a moment where it just kind of sits there and realize, kind of an awakening. 
Very clever. It is humdrum. We've sung it too many times, but very cleverly devised. It came out of the Spirit of God. And um, the spiritual practice or the spiritual word we would use is amenuensis, the leading of the Spirit in the creative act as if the Lord himself were scribing it using my body, amenuensis. Little things that make that song so important. Great song. That song is so iconic that as I typed in to Google, people need... It was there. <laughs> Google knows that song. Because I've loved words, and because I read Charles Dickens, um, words have become my friend. And for anyone who wants to write songs or write poetry or write down music for other people to play, loving words and what they can say in the context of a, of a creative, uh, worshipful act is everything. If you're a singer, you bring words to life with the sound of your voice, the cut of your chin, the expression on your face, the bearing of your body, and it's not showbiz to look as if you know what you're doing. You know, all the years growing up, we were taught that, you know, gosh golly, I'm kind of afraid to... If you're a singer, you bring the text alive by who you are. The look on your face and is there, any, and is there anything going on there? People need a voice. It's painful, learning <laughs> to let go. We've all been to music camp where we've felt the pain of the child. Maybe we've been the child trying to sing a solo or <laughs> play a solo. Breathe in, Spirit of God. What is the song about? Sell it. Make it happen. If you're singing, if you're a singer, let the words come to life with the sound of your voice your body, your posture. If you're a dancer, you show us the text with your movements. My daughter's a dancer, among other things. The arc and flow of the movement, the, the way she holds her hands, those crazy ballet poses that give your body a sense of dignity and a sense of grounding. Subtlety of motions with the fingers. If you're a pianist or a brass player or an instrumentalist of any, any kind, well, we want to have control of our instrument, don't we? We want to have prepared and practiced and be able to start notes and art phrases and make music. And unless you're playing an accompaniment to the phone book, you really need to know what's in, it, in the song that you're playing. We often defer to the band, I'm afraid. And now the band will play for our transgressions. And was there ever a greater piece, a more compelling piece? But there's a text, a line, and the composer has lifted out those moments and surrounded those moments with a musical context which heightens the force and weight of them. And unless the leaders know what they are and tells the, the players, then we're just playing notes. As wonderful as it is, our experience would be so much richer if we knew what the text was. And of course, we don't sing those songs anymore in the meeting. So we've got to recycle them somehow. I've, I've done a few uh, like healing waters. When shall I come into the healing waters? Albert Orsburn. Doesn't get any better than that. But we never sing that tune because it's really old-fashioned. And So a few years ago for the girls at the Territorial Music School, I wrote a setting which in the bridges and for the piano did the old tune. And then there was a new tune that we sang. And then in the bridge it came back to the old tune, another part of it. And we sang the next verse and so it was reintroducing wonderful lyrics, 
preserving something of the heritage of the melody and yet something fresh that the kids could identify with in a more contemporary nature. Something about the craft of writing. I enjoy writing songs. And for me, uh, that's a question I'm, I'm often asked, what comes first, the words or the music? Well, for me, <laughs> it is words. And even if I'm writing my own text and I'm using a scripture reference or I'm, I'm imagining it, it from a fresh, open space, the words come first. And surprisingly, the way the Spirit of God works in my craft is that by the time I'm finished manipulating the text and there's a pile of paper scraps on the floor, I just keep throwing it away until and circling and starring and, and bringing forward... Finally, when the text is there, the tune has already somehow, miraculously, appeared. And rhythms. And it's only when I go to the piano after that and I, I think, oh, here's a moment where I need a harmonic move that I haven't imagined yet. And I'm, I look for the inner workings. And so for me, the, the words come first, always. Some people don't need that and are happy to work the other way around. Um, but I, I'm, um, I'm a slave to it now. I need to know what the words are so that I can write music that amplifies the words. If I write a lovely tune and then go looking for a set of words, I mean, that might not be the best. That's not the best way for me to work. Sing along with me if you know this one. Moment by moment, I give all my life to you. Moment by moment. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> All my heart, Lord, every dream and each intent. Let me be in every sense. Moment by moment. More. The phrase moment by moment is, isn't novel. There's, if you Google it, there's tons. And the way that I was imagining that little phrase, moment by moment, was um, we, were, we were in England and there was the welcome of the High Council. Big meeting. Everybody, come on, let's welcome the High Council. <laughs> oh boy. And... Uh, we're doing it again this year, right? We're looking for a new general. Uh, the ISB was there, the ISS was there, and the communication secretary said, you got to write something for this that makes sense in the context of this, uh, this service, the welcome of the high council. So I, uh, I thought about who these people were, the, um, our leaders across the world, most of them older, and I thought, well... Who do I know that is saintly? And I thought of a few people. And I thought of my grandfather. And I thought of... Uh, he used to get up in the morning and I can just imagine him stretching. And, Thank you, Lord, for today. And he'd push himself off his bed and he'd go into his day and he'd read scripture. And I thought of my grandfather and I, I wrote that little song about getting up each morning with your sunshine in my heart it's been a treasure Lord I was imagining my grandfather I needed a context for the song and I, I thought of these uh, saints of our organization at least I hope they're saintly coming together and so I wrote about somebody that I knew about and the words were given and we came to the chorus, moment by moment, I give all my life to you. It just seemed like very natural. That's what we want from our leaders, to know that moment by moment, uh, they've got it right. I, I, I can't help mentioning Lionel Richie whenever I hear my, my songs, because <laughs> uh, in a sense, I was a child of the 80s. I, I was Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, all my life until uh, at about the age of 19 or 20, I went to the eastern coast of the United States and took part in a Jesus band. 
you know, guitars and Hammond organ and a couple of, couple of brass players, Charlie Baker, Jude Gottrich, Philip Smith, Steve Boa. Oh, come on. And we were all in this group together. It was called Redemption. Nice, strong, rocky name. And we, we played music every night on the boardwalk, gave our witness. In between the sets, we talked to people, prayed with people. 19 years old. Well, you, you, that's going to change you. Yeah. Um, that was the first song that happened for that group. My first song, Charlie, uh, who has played um, almost from the beginning of his career as the uh, principal trombone of the New Jersey Symphony, all his life, still is doing it. He said to me, we need something to close the evening with, something that kind of um, sums up and is like an altar call, but we don't have an altar. We're just going to ask people if they want to talk or pray to come forward. So I wrote a song for that called A Change Will Come. A change will come when you give your heart to Jesus. And that was the beginning. I began to play with words and their meaning and sense deeply how important the musical, the music, and the relationship of music to text. That's what I'm trying to sell to you. The relationship of text as it um, brings our music making or our painting or our dancing to life. Uh, an example of, uh, of an arrangement that takes text into account would be uh, if you're familiar with the MSB recording with, uh, with Sylvie and she sings Amazing Grace. And it does a wonderful job. And this is a song that takes her from a bottom G to a top E flat for the singer. So it's not for everybody to sing. And she just kind of, amazing. So there's a wonder, the wonder of that initial thought, low key, low key at the beginning of the song. And then through the verses, we get uh, the song uh, evolves. And then that amazing grace, we lift to a very, very high place of, of heart and energy and ecstasy, really. So in arranging the song, I, tr I tried to bring the, the, the people who are listening and the musicians who are involved in it along on that journey from the uh, dynamism of that thought it, when it's here. This, this is for me. This is, this is amazing. And then we give it away. And then to the world, we're lifting our hallelujahs and we're screaming our, amazing, our amazement. And it's, it's so effective, and she does a wonderful, wonderful job of that. Big high note at the end. Not many can pull it off, so the art is the icing on the, on the cake, really. A high art and a wonderful voice. But there's an example of, of an arrangement, not a composition, but um, there's lots of playing with the rhythms, if you listen to that recording. It was sort of in 3-4, but it was lots of diddles and noodles and zip de doo -dahs in there to give those words a new sense of handing forward. Um, one, of, one of my favorite things has become leading singers and leading choirs. And I, I spoke to the singers this morning and said, I'm aware that this is what's happening, but I, I don't do it on purpose. There's a sense of handing the words to the singer this way, rather than conducting that way. And I've, I only know that I do that from watching videos <laughs> that, um, because I've become so conscious of here's, here's where the phrase is going. Ah, here's, here's a word that needs lifting, and I'm, I'm trying to mirror what the singers need. And if you are a choral leader or even a bandmaster, for that matter, there are moments when it's beyond the beat. The beat I mean, the beat's going to happen. But how do we approach that word that's so important? Amazing grace. How do we give the word grace some poise, some dignity, some depth, some heart? We have to lay it out. We can't just point it downwards. So I know that physically there's a difference now that, uh, as, I, as I lead. There's a difference for me physically. And as I sing, I take more time to parse the word and to hear all the parts of the word. In every phrase of music that we sing or play, there are operative words, words that are more important. 
When you throw away the articles and the conjunctions, you're left with verbs like revive my soul. Those are the places where singers need to go, those operative words. And to that word and from that word, the musical phrase ascends or retreats. My mentor and friend Robert Redhead was a master at creating musical settings for words. Another moment from our little time in, in England, it was a, a day with the general. The ISB was there, the ISS was there, and I heard a fanfare of praise for the very first time. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou of... And it was very, very special because Robert has unison line carrying the melody against some sustained chords. As if to say, here's the starting place, the recognition of the beauty and simplicity of the Lord Jesus in our life. And the next verse kind of builds, strengthens. We feel our faith getting quickened. And then somewhere along the line, the time signature changes and the excitement comes in. And as only he could do, and a lot of us are doing it now because he started it, as far as I'm concerned, all the busyness of the context of, of energy, musical energy, rhythm from the inner parts, and the melody still soaring through there in its completeness. There's Robert's gift is leave the melody alone. Keep it right there. There is where the tune is, and under that comes all of the um, effervescence of the musical accompaniment. I wanted to say just, a, this is my opinion, but I have never written a theme and variations for band or for piano for that matter, because I find that the, uh, that the musical meaning has to be not about what's clever uh, or in my head, but it must be about the text. So if I fragment the music and take a little out of here and a little out of there, all I'm really doing is appealing to the audience's ability to pick it out. Here's a little snatch of this. Here's a little snatch of that. Did you catch that? No? Oh, well, maybe you'll get the next one, and there'll be a little goody here and there. And that is a form, and some have done it really well. The Holy War is full of references, which somehow when they're all pushed together in a way that only Ray Stedman and Alan can do, you come across. But for me, I've never done it, and I, I probably never will now, <laughs> because um, the text has to be there. There's has, there has to be a meaning for every note that goes onto the page, and that comes from the verses as they roll forward. Johann Sebastian Bach said, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. And many of his compositions, even the uh, instrumental ones at the bottom, he would write, or on the top, he would write, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Fanfare of praise, you get that impression. Uh, that's a place where we all need to be. Uh, I'm going to conclude with um, a reference to 1 Corinthians 13. It's a parody. In this room, we have artists of diverse kinds, musicians, singers, perhaps arrangers, composers, songwriters, of various backgrounds and various degrees of ability, various degrees of education and experience. In the spirit of 1 Corinthians 13, I would say to you, though I write with the harmonies of jazz or blues, yet not have love for words, I am but a resounding tinkle. If I invent rhythms and textures that amaze and amuse, yet love not words, I am bupkis. It's an American expression. Bupkis. If I give all my intellect to mastering every musical style ever conceived, but have not words in the center of my consciousness, I am diddly squat. Words never fail. But performances often do. 
When I was a young aspirant, I talked like it, I thought like it, I reasoned like it, like a child, always wanting my art to be about me. Me. But when I became a man, I put away childish things and embraced the heart of the matter, the heart that is the text, the essence of what is to be communicated through the art. Then I saw only half the picture. Now I get it. Cleverness is not a substitute for content. For we have nothing to say unless we are saying it through words. Our arts do not stand on their own. Certainly not in worship. Maybe in the concert hall. But not in worship. Now these three remain. Creativity expression, and words. For me, the greatest of these is word. Uh, allow your truth to speak to us, Lord, and quicken every word that we play or sing or imagine or bring to our forms of art and thereby share your spirit with us that we might share it with others. Let it be so. Amen.